Welcome to Choice Classic Radio, where we bring to you the greatest old-time radio shows. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and thank you for donating at choiceclassicradio.com. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield. The only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A man walks into your office and tells you he returned to his home to find that his wife was gone. She left no indication where she was going. Foul play is suspected. Your job, find her. The modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality in both regular and king size. And we're the only one that does it. Premium quality in a cigarette means the world's best tobaccos, the best ingredients, the best cigarette paper. Only Chesterfield gives you this premium quality in both popular sizes. King Size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other King Size cigarette. That's certainly important to every King Size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference except that king-size Chesterfield gives you more than a fifth longer smoke. Yes, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality, both regular and king-size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, July 7th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way into work, and it was 4.58 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Joe, that you? Yeah. Been here long? No, I just got in. Sure a beautiful day, isn't it? Yeah, summer's really here, isn't it? This daylight saving time makes a difference. Got a lot more time, seems like. Made me think about my vacation. Well, you're doing a couple of weeks, aren't you? Yeah, first part of August. Mm-hmm. Figured out where you're going yet? Yeah, Faye and I talked it out. You know, Joe? Oh, what's that? I think maybe I had Armin figured wrong. Armin, that's your brother-in-law? Yeah. Mm-hmm. This year, Faye and I got to talking where we're going to spend the vacation. Faye wants to go up to Big Bear. I'm saying Mexico. Yeah. You know, I figure a little fishing. I hear the yellows are hitting pretty good. The what? Yellowtails. Oh, yeah. You don't fish much, no, do you? No, I don't Joe? fish at all. Either. Well, they're supposed to be hitting pretty good, but Faye can't see Mexico. And oh. darn if old Armin doesn't chime in and say he thinks Mexico's a great idea. Well, that's swell. Yeah. Tells Faye all about the beaches down there and how good the food is, all about the air, healthy. You know, really sells her. So that's where you're going, huh? No, Faye didn't buy it. It's going to the mountains. Well, fishing's supposed to be pretty good up there, too, isn't it? That's what I've read, I guess. I, don't I know. suppose so, but... Old Armin, how do you like that guy? He sure surprised me. Yeah, maybe he's going to work out, huh? <laughs> yeah. I'll get it. Okay. Homicide Friday. Yes, sir, it is. I beg your pardon. Could you talk a little louder? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Well, when was that? I see. When? Yes, sir. What was that address again? All right, I have it. Yes. Yes, sir, that's right. We'll be right out. Right, bye. Well, we got one to roll on. Kidnapping out in Hollywood. The man on the phone gave his name as Henry Wagner. He said that he'd come home from work and found that his wife was gone. He said on the phone that he'd found a note demanding ransom and costing him against calling the police. 5.22 p.m. Frank and I arrived at the house on Temple Hill Avenue. We parked the car down the street from the house and went up to the front door. Frank would remain in the car for a few minutes and then follow. In that way, if the kidnappers were watching the house, they wouldn't be as likely to know that we were working on the case. I rang the bell and waited. 
Yes, you're the police? Yes, sir, that's right. My name's Friday. Oh, hello. Come in, please, quickly. I don't want them to see you. Who's them, sir? The kidnappers. They might be watching. I don't know what I'm going to do. Terrible thing to have happen. Just doesn't make sense. All right, now, sir, if you just try to calm down and tell me what happened here, we're going to start right from the beginning. All right. I got home from school about 4.30. Myra wasn't here. I looked at the house for her, figured, like you said on the phone, that she might have gone to the store. Uh When I couldn't find her, I started looking for a note. That's when I found the ransom demand right there on the coffee table. And you said you got home from school, is that it? Yes, I teach political science at the university. Well, when did you last see your wife? When I left this morning, about 7.30. I have a class at 8. Have you talked to her since? Yes, I called her about 1.15. Did everything seem all right then? I mean, did she seem to be upset, anything like that? No, no, everything seemed to be normal. Did she say if there was anyone with her when you talked to her? No, if there was, she didn't give any indication of it. I see. I know that this isn't a hoax, if that's what you're thinking. I know that Myra wouldn't do a thing like this. She's a serious woman. I guess you might say that she had a rather dull sense of humor. No, I know that she wouldn't do a thing like this as a joke. Well, no, sir, it's not that. I'm just trying to get all the facts here. I wonder if I could see the note. Yes, I left it over here on the desk. That'll be my partner. I'll let him in if it's all right. Wagner, this is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you Hello, do, Mr. sir? Wagner. How do you do? I'll get the note. Well, I'd rather you wouldn't handle it anymore, sir. Oh, all right. You going to try to get some fingerprints from it? Is that right? Well, that's the idea, yes, sir. You read it, Joe? Yeah, it's made up of newsprint. It's been cut out of the paper. Looks like one of the morning papers. Yeah. I'll read it to you. It says, put $10,000 in fives, tens, and twenties in the shoebox. Make sure the bills are unmarked. On July 8th, drive up Deer Canyon Drive at 10.30 p.m., five miles past the turnoff. You'll see a white string across the road. Drop the shoebox out of the car, go on back home. Your wife will be returned. Don't tell the cops. If you tell anybody, we'll kill your wife. Deer Canyon Drive. Yeah, you know, it's up above Laurel. Oh, yeah. $10,000. Do you have that kind of money, Mr. Wagner? No, sir. I don't know how I'm going to raise it. I have to, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. Have you noticed anyone lately that's been in the neighborhood here? I mean, anybody loitering around without any reason to be here? No, I haven't. Of course, you must understand I'm not home a great deal. But Myra didn't say anything about it. I'm sure she would have if she'd seen anybody like that. You and your wife have any enemies that do a thing like this, would you know? None that I can think of. Do you have any household help? I beg pardon? Household help. Anyone that comes in to help your wife with the housework. You know, a day maid, something like that. Well, there's Betty Jo. She comes in once a week to clean up the house. When was she last here? Let me see. That was Saturday. That's her usual day. Saturday, I I guess it was then. Didn't you see her last week? No. You see, I had to go out by Pomona this last weekend. Series of lectures I wanted to catch. I left early Saturday morning, didn't get back until late that night. Did your wife go with you? No, she stayed at home. She had a little touch of the virus and figured she'd better stay at home and take care of it. Are you sure this is the right thing to do? Maybe I should have handled this myself. No, sir, you did the right thing. I wonder if you could give us a description of your wife, Mr. Wagner. Why? You aren't going to tell anyone else about this, are you? No, sir. The information will be handled in the usual confidential manner. Oh. Well, I guess you men know what you're doing. All right, sir, if you'd just give us a description, if you could... Well, Myra is about five feet three. I guess she weighs about 130 pounds. Mm-hmm. How old is she, sir? 42. Just turned 42. Birthday last month, June 14th. How about the color of her hair? Sort of an auburn, I guess you'd call it. A little, little gray up in here, along the sides. Mm-hmm. Would you know what she was wearing? No, I wouldn't have the slightest idea. I don't know her clothes well enough to be able to look at what's in her closet and tell you what she had on. Mm-hmm. How about Mark's? I don't think I understand. I'm sorry. I mean, any visible birthmarks or scars, anything that might make it easier to identify her? No, I don't think so. Oh, wait a minute. There's a very small scar just under her ear right here. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, Myra and I went fishing up in the Sierras. Myra got a trout fly caught there. When they took it out, it left just a very small scar. But I don't think you'd be able to see it unless you were really looking for it. Mm -hmm. Anything else outstanding about her? No, there isn't. I wonder if we could have a photo of her. Do you have one? Of course. Why don't you give us the address of this Betty Joe? Surely. I think Myra kept it in the phone book. I'll look for you. Do you think they'll really do it, officer? Kill Myra? Well, we're going to try to stop him, sir. I don't think so. Well, how about the money? Should I get it together? Not a lot of time if I have to meet them tomorrow night. We'll take care of that. Here's the address. Thank you, sir. I don't know what I'll do if they hurt Myra. I just don't know. It's odd, isn't it, Sergeant? What's that? Myra and I have been married for 22 years. I guess I always just took her for granted. Haven't been separated at all during that time. Just took her for granted. Yes, sir. I guess you have to lose something before you know what it's worth. 5.43 p.m. We asked Mr. Wagner not to touch anything in the house. We told him that after his wife had been returned and our men could move safely about the neighborhood, the house would be gone over for physical evidence. 
Two men came out from the office and a stakeout was placed on the house. The note was taken downtown and photographed. Dean Bergman lifted several clean prints from it. However, comparison with those taken from Mr. Wagner eliminated them. The maid, Betty Jo, was contacted, but she could tell us nothing. In the meantime, Sergeant J. Allen of the crime lab prepared a shoe box as directed by the abductors. Dummy packages of money were placed in the box and the container was wiped clean of all fingerprints. The area where the meat was to take place was staked out. The following morning, Wednesday, July 8th, Henry Wagner went to teach his classes at the university as usual. Late in the afternoon, he returned home, and at 9.45 p.m., he got into his car and left the house. I'd gotten into the back seat of the car earlier, and I kept out of sight. In an undercover unit behind us, Frank, Lieutenant Gorham, and Gil Encinas kept us under observation in the event that we missed contact with the kidnappers. 10.26 p.m., we turned off Benedict Canyon onto Deer Canyon Drive. I hope I'm doing the right thing. I can't help thinking of what they might do to Myra. Well, try to take it easy, Mr. Wagner. We know how you feel. Everything that can be done has been taken care of here. That's what you've been telling me for the past hour. It doesn't make me feel any better about what's happening. Can you still see that car behind us? No. I think they dropped back when we turned off Benedict. Uh -huh. How's it look up ahead? Can't see much. Dark. How far off the canyon have we come? About four and a half miles. You got your box right there ready to throw it out? <laughs> Yes, sir. Right here on the seat. All right, now remember, when you toss it out, try to lift it by the strings. Right, I'll remember. I just hope we're doing the right thing. I'll never forgive myself if anything happens to Myra. Ten thousand dollars just isn't worth it. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. There it is. String across the road. See anybody around it? No, it's so dark. I can't see anything but what's in front of the car. How close are we to the place here? About 50 or 60 feet. All right, now take it slow. Don't give any indication that you aren't doing exactly what they told you to. And remember, don't handle that box. Hold it for the string. All right. We're here. I'm throwing the box out. All right, now close your door. What now? Go up the road a little, and then turn around and drive back. Act like everything is just the way they told you to handle it. All right. Take it easy now. We can turn around here. All right. You see anyone move for the money? No, not yet. Maybe when I get turned around. Just a second. There's a driveway here. Oh, it's pretty dark back there. All right, can you see anything at all? Nothing there. I don't see anyone. All right, now just keep driving. If there's anybody to pick up the money, it'll look better if you don't cause any trouble. I don't know about all of this, Sergeant. Somehow I still can't get the idea out of my mind that we've done the wrong thing. That they know all about it and that they're going to kill Myra. Now, there's no reason that they should know that there's anything wrong, Mr. Wagner. From what they can see, you're doing just what they told you. They got nothing to tell them any different here. But what if they found out? What if they know that you're working on the case? What if they know about it? They might kill Myra. I'd never forgive myself. I never should have told you about it. I should have taken care of it myself. They'll kill her. I know they will. They'll kill her because you're working on it. The way it is now, she hasn't got a chance. No, you're wrong there, Wagner. Hmm? The odds are on her side now. 10.45 p.m. Henry Wagner and I left the meeting place. About a mile down Deer Canyon Drive, Wagner dropped me off, and then he started down Benedict Canyon Drive and continued on home. I met with Frank, Lieutenant Gorham, and Sergeant Gil Encinas, and we started back on foot. We cut off the road and waited on the hill overlooking the meeting place. Frank told me that they'd seen no activity on the road while Wagner and I were making the meet. We moved in closer. 11.30 p.m., no sign of the kidnappers. The moon came up and we could see the white string across the road. In a patch of manzanita, we could see the shoebox containing the dummy packages of money. We waited. Midnight, 1.30 a.m., still no sign of the kidnappers. 2.30, 4. At 4.45 a.m., the sun came up and Frank and I left the area. Lieutenant Gorham and Sergeant Gil Encinas continued to stake the meeting place. If the kidnappers had been in the vicinity, we'd miss them. Our only course now was to wait for them to contact Henry Wagner again. 8.15 a.m., Frank and I checked out and went on home to take a shower and get something to eat. At 11.12 a.m. Thursday morning, we checked back into the office. Rough night, huh? Yeah, there's nothing to show for it. Anything from Gorham and Encinas? No, I don't see anything. There was one thing I found out. What's that? I need a heavier coat for nights. Yeah? So on ad in the magazine. Advertise those English duffel coats. Look real good. What? Duffel coats. Wore them in the North Atlantic during the war. You know, Joe, they're real heavy. Got a hood that comes up. Should be real warm. A hood? Yeah, you know, like a monk wears. When you aren't wearing it, it looks just like a collar. When it gets cold, you 
Raise up the little gimmick, and there you are, warm as anything. You know, Frank, somehow I just can't see you in there. Yeah? Well, I noticed you weren't any too warm last night. Next time we do duty like that, I'm going to be ready for it. Yeah. Just like a monk. I'll get it. Homicide Friday. Yes. Oh, yes, Mr. When was that? Uh-huh. Yes, sir, right away. Well, that's it. Huh? The Wagner woman. She's home. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Friends, you'll remember some months ago, we read you our first report, the six months report on the effects of smoking. Then more recently, we read you the eight months report. Now, here is the latest one. The full 10 months report confirms again. No adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfields. This from a medical specialist who is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. 45% of them have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over 10 years. After 10 full months, the specialist reports he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report. Buy much milder Chesterfield, regular or king size. The cigarette that's best for you. It's 11.30 a.m. Frank and I drove out to the Wagner home. The officers on stakeout told us that Mrs. Wagner had walked into the house at about 11 o'clock that morning. As soon as she'd gotten inside the house, she collapsed. The family doctor had been called, and she was treated for shock. Other than some scratches on her arms and around her face, she was unharmed. The officers told us that they'd been unable to interrogate her so far. We talked to the doctor, and he told us that we could talk to her until the sedative took effect. Honey, these are policemen. They want to ask you a few questions. What? Police officers, honey. There's Mr. Friday, and there's Mr. Smith. Oh, yes. They want to ask you some questions, dear, about the people who took you. Oh, all right. It won't take very long, Miss Wagner. That's all right. I, I want to help you get them. All right, now, if you just tell us how it happened... How it happened? Yes, ma'am. Sergeant, you have to do this now. Maybe later when she's rested. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Wagner. We haven't got much choice here. We'd like to get to the people who did this. If we wait until later, we might not be able to get them. Yes, I didn't think of that. Well, if the doctor says it's all right, go ahead. Ms. Wagner? Yes? Do you know the people who did it? The people who took you? No. you never seen them before? No, never. All right, now, could you just tell us what happened? I guess so. They came to the door about 2.30. Who were they, ma'am? Well, I just saw a man. Later, when we got into the car, there was a woman, too. All right, go ahead. They told me that Henry had been in an accident, that he'd been hurt, that he was at the hospital. Said they wanted to take me to him. Yes, ma'am. I didn't know any different. I went with them. I thought that Henry was hurt. I didn't know any different. You have to do this, officers. She's home, safe. That's all I care about. That's all that's important. Why don't you let her get some rest? Then you can talk to her, talk as much as you want to. But please, you can see what this is doing to her. Yes, sir. Now, look, this isn't any easier on us. We've got a job to do here, like we had when she was gone. We know how you feel, but we'd like to get to those people. It's all right, Henry. I'm all right, dear. Where'd they take you, ma'am? First, I think they were going to take me to a house near here. I, I didn't notice the street, but it was near here. I'm sure of that. Then when we got near there, I, I knew that something was wrong, that they weren't going to take me to Henry like they said. I knew it then. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I told them to let me out of the car. Said that they'd better let me go. Mm -hmm. The woman, she was in the back seat with me, said for me to keep my mouth closed. I tried to get out the door and she hit me. Then the two of them got into an argument. The man started to yell at the woman that it wasn't any good, that they'd better forget the whole thing. And the woman said that they'd gone too far for that now, that they, they had to go through with it. Uh-huh. Well, then they put a blindfold on me. Tied my hands and blindfolded me, and then they started to drive. Well, at any time, did either of them use a name, you know, in talking to each other? No, I don't think so. At least if they did, I don't remember it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Miss Wagner. Well, I, then they started to drive. I couldn't see where they were going, but I know that they headed out the Arroyo Seco toward Pasadena. I could tell from the way we went. Then I heard the woman talk about the turnoff to get on the Seco. Right then, the man told her to shut up. Yes, ma'am. We drove for quite a while and then stopped. They made me get out and took me into a house. Did you have any idea where you were at the time, ma'am? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, ma'am. Well, they took me into the house and put me in a room, tied me up. I couldn't move, couldn't do anything. They locked the door and I could hear them arguing in the next room. 
man was really telling the woman off, said that she was a fool, that she'd really botched the whole thing up. I see. That night, they brought in a plate of food, told me it was time to eat. All there was were some prunes. That's what they fed me all the time I was there, prunes. Never did take the blindfold off. Was there anything at all that would let you know where you were? Oh, a couple of things. They're probably kind of silly, but maybe you can make something out of them. What's that, ma'am? Well, there was a clock that was in the room where they had me, one of those chime clocks, told every 15 minutes, like Westminster chime. Yes, ma'am. I don't think it was a very big clock. Chime sounded small. Mm Mm-hmm. Then there were the trains. Trains? Yes, every once in a while I'd hear trains going past. Sounded like they were near, maybe a couple blocks away, not much more than that. But do you think that you could give us a description of the man and woman, Ms. Wagner? Yes, I think so. First, I was so upset with thinking that Henry was hurt that I didn't notice, but I think I can describe them for you. All right, ma'am, that'll be fine. There's one thing, though. What's that? I'd be positive if I saw them. 12 noon, we continued to talk to the Wagner woman. She gave us a description of the man and woman who had kidnapped her and a description of the car they'd used. We called the information into the office and a local and an APV were gotten out. We ran the descriptions through R&I, but we got no make. 2.45 p.m. As one of the possibilities for identifying the locality described by Mrs. Wagner, Frank and I left the house and drove to the office of one of the milk companies in the city. We talked to the driver that handled the area in which Mrs. Wagner said the kidnappers were going to stop. He couldn't identify the man and the woman from the description. We checked two more milk companies, and on the third, we got a tentative identification. The driver of the route told us that we could be asking about a Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Harper, he thought. He gave us their address, and Frank and I drove out there. On the way, we called the names into R&I and had them make a check for us. They said they had a record on a Thomas Harper who answered the description. He'd served time in San Quentin and in Folsom Penitentiary. He'd been sentenced both times for armed robbery and ADW. There was no record on Mrs. Harper and no wants at the present time for her husband. 5.57 p.m. Better try it again, man. Huh? All right. Probably aren't in. Mm-hmm. There's a car parked down the street here. Could be theirs. Checks on that description we got from the wagon woman. Wait a minute. I think somebody's coming. Yeah, what do you want? You Thomas Harper? Yeah, that's right. Police officers would like to talk to you. What about? Just like to talk to you. All right, come on in. Who is it, Tom? Cops. What do they want? Say they want to talk. I don't know what about. Just a routine investigation. Who are you trying to kid? What do you mean by that, Harper? Somebody's done something, you need a pigeon. I got a record, so I'm right for you guys to lean What's on. What's the matter? You got something to worry about? Not a thing in the world, but I know you guys, you're going to try. What do you want, anyway? You people tell us your activities for the past four days? What for? Just tell us, will you? Yeah, tell us. You got an angle, you wouldn't be here. You're trying to pin something on us, and you know it. You want to tell us what you've been doing? We haven't left the house at all. Can you prove that? Prove it to who? You? You got no right to come in here and ask a lot of questions. She's right. You haven't got any right to do that. Either you pull us in or you get out of here. All right, Harper. You're getting ready to leave anyway. We'll see you later. Yeah, let's go, Frank. All right. You better call the office and have the house staked. As soon as Ms. Wagner feels better, we'll have her see if she can make an identification here, huh? I don't think that'll be too hard, Joe. Hmm? Found this bill from the gas company on the table in there. Yeah? House in Pasadena. Harper's mugshot had been pulled and sent to the Wagner home for identification. Mrs. Wagner was still under sedative. 7.15 p.m., Frank and I drove out to Pasadena. We got in touch with the police department out there, and two officers were assigned to accompany us to the address on the gas bill. The house was unoccupied, and there were advertising papers strewn all about on the lawn. With the officers, we entered the house and went through it. In some of the rooms, there were pieces of furniture, and in the living room of the house, we found a mantel clock that chimed on the quarter hour. On an end table, we found a ball of white string that looked like the same type that had been used to mark the meeting place up on Deer Canyon Drive. In one of the back bedrooms, we found prune seeds scattered around on the floor. A stakeout was arranged on the house. We contacted the men watching the Harper residence and found that the suspects were still there. 9.56 p.m., Frank and I arrived back at the Harper home in Hollywood. The lights were out and the house was dark. Frank went around to the back of the house. Yeah? What do you want this time of the night? Did you guys ever give up? All right, Harper, let's get dressed. We want to talk to you downtown. You tying a pinch to me? You called it. For what? Kidnapping. You're out of your mind. Come on, get dressed. Who is it, honey? Cops say we kidnapped somebody. What? Fuzz has an idea we kidnapped somebody. You're kidding. Afraid not, Miss Harper. You better get dressed, too. Anybody else in the house? 
Yeah, we take in board. Don't get smart. Where's that door go? Bedroom. Just the one bedroom here? That's right. We're roughing it. Just the kitchen over here? Yeah. All right, come on. How about the bath? In there. All right, we'll all go. Come on. All right. Let's go back to the kitchen. This door go out the backyard? You're a cop. You figure it out. Okay, Frank. Everything all right in there, Joe? Yeah, fine. You ain't kidding about this kidnap thing, are you? No, nope, let's go. What makes you figure it might be us? You got a house in Pasadena? Why do you ask that? Have you got one? No. You're lying. Property records in Pasadena say you have. We checked the house. Matches the one we're looking for. All right? That's right. We got the woman you kidnapped. She's identified your picture, you and your wife. She couldn't identify me. I haven't got a record. You ain't taking me no place. Frank, get out of my way. Cut. Hold it. Hold it right there. All right, come on. On your feet. Yeah. Now, I'll shake you. He's clean. Hands behind you. I told you what had happened. I told you we should have let her go right away. I told you. Oh, shut up. You and your bright ideas. Ten grand easy. You and your bright ideas. Well, look what it got us. Look, Buster. You didn't yell when you thought of getting your hot little hands on that dough. You were all for it then. Well, we lost. What do you want me to do about it? Break down and ball? Should have known. Should have known from the beginning. I had nothing but trouble with you from the start. Always wanting something easy. Always wanting big money. Never satisfied. That's the trouble with kids. Bad losers. Great winners, but bad losers. Well, you're a big boy now. You lost. That's all there is to it. Stop whining. Easy for you to say. If you get through with me, I'll be in for life. You got no record. She has now. Let's go. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 10th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, only the modern cigarette, Chesterfield, gives you this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. No adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfields. And only the modern cigarette, Chesterfield, gives you premium quality in both regular and king size. Now, I know Chesterfield is best for me and best for you. Buy them regular or king size. Either way, they're much milder to give you all the pleasure the modern cigarette can give. Thomas Fenton Harper was tried and found guilty of kidnapping. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in the state penitentiary, Folsom, California, without possibility of parole. His wife, Alice Mabel Harper, received a like sentence and is now in the California Institution for Women, Corona, California. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give a few dimes to help a child out of the smallest prison in the world, an iron lung? Well, that's what you're doing when you join the 1953 March of Dimes. Remember, crippled children are depending on your help. So give your dimes and your dollars to the 1953 March of Dimes. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Jonathan Hole. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. 